church. Uh, oh, yeah. That's, no, that's nice. Um, I actually hate that. I, <laughs> you know, it's such a, like, I don't know how to start the mess. Okay, now that is really, that's really bad. Um, next sermon you'll be preaching. I'll show up next week. I'm going to have one chair right here facing you. And we'll just go down the line and uh, it'll be great. Uh, if you're online, um, you're actually in a better place because these people are horrible today. So I love you way more, our online community. Super glad that you're here. Um, seriously, though, super thankful uh, for every single one of you that are, that are here today. Um, we're having an important conversation for a few weeks just about our role as servants. And uh, I think it's key for us just to come around in light of where we are as a church and uh, what God is doing in our uh, community. Uh, for us to really understand this is, is super key. Um, do you remember uh, Hooked on Phonics? I tell you what I like about Hooked on Phonics was the phone number. Anybody remember the phone number for Hooked on Phonics? This was the phone number, 1-800-A-B-C-D-E-F-G. That's a good phone number, 1-800-A-B-C-D-E-F-G. And I'm watching the commercial for Hooked on Phonics and some poor distraught mom is uh, on the commercial and she's just, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. My little Jimmy, he can't read as well as his peers and I didn't know what I was going to do until I saw the commercial for Hooked on Phonics. And then I knew that was going to be the answer. But she said, I messed up. Like I kept watching the commercial. She said, I must have written down that phone number a thousand times. <laughs> Ma'am, it's, it's the alphabet. <laughs> Maybe it's not Jimmy that has the problem, ma'am. <laughs> Maybe it's you. You know, it's so hard when you try to help people, you know, you're just, you got a good heart and you're just trying to, you know, do some sort of service for somebody else and people can always pick it apart or make it super difficult. Uh, several years ago, I, I purchased 500 Taco Bell burritos uh, from Taco Bell, called in, made the order, and then went to the Taco Bell because we were going to take all 500 burritos to this uh, local high school at lunch and just give them out uh, for free. And I showed up at the Taco Bell after I'd placed the order. I walked up to the uh, cashier and the lovely lady behind the cash register said, how may I help you? I said, we, we have the order, the uh, 500 burritos. And she went, Is that for here to go? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's for here. Just bring them all to table 12 and all that. <laughs> she's just trying to help. We're all just trying to help, right? We're just trying to do our best with what we have. And when it comes down to it, the church is really just a massive service industry. Uh, we have been positioned in this location, in this moment in history, to be a service uh, to other people around us. And, and yet it's about something bigger than the people around us. We are actually serving God as we serve the people around us. And Pastor John laid a clear foundation of, of our role as servants last week. He painted the broad brushstroke picture for us that once we get who Jesus is, that if he is Lord, then that means I sit under him. And I sit under my Lord as a servant. And what servants do is they serve. And there was one uh, individual named John the Baptist that he highlighted for a few minutes last week that I would like to kind of plumb a little bit deeper into. He opened the door to John the Baptist last week, and we're going to walk through that door and uh, just take another glimpse at what John the Baptist was all about. Because for me, he was a guy that really, uh, his, 
his understanding here and his heart here with regard to service are such a great example for me and you. So if you have your Bible, open up to the book of John and go to chapter one, uh, John chapter one. And as you turn there, um, this, this first part in John one it gives us what, what I like to call is the intersection of JB and JC. Um, John the Baptist intersecting with Jesus the Christ. And uh, it's an important moment. Did you know that when you intersect with Jesus, that there really is, is meant to be a wholesale change in your heart, in your soul, that when you cross paths, that the full scope of who Jesus is is meant to, uh, sooner than later, really affect every single aspect of your life. And that, this is what's going on here. In John chapter one, look at verse six. Here's John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself, John the Baptist, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, which is Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, John the Baptist was a, a prophet of God. He's actually the last prophet uh, before Jesus comes. And this is key. If, if you're familiar, uh, the Old Testament wrapped up. And between the Old Testament and when we get the New Testament, there had been 400 years of silence from God. There's no new word from God. There's no new prophets from God. No new revelation from God. And then you get to the New Testament. You get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And here comes John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist comes as a prophet, but John the Baptist was also related to Jesus. And they had an inner interaction actually uh, before they were even born. Uh, Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mom, was pregnant at the same time as Mary, Jesus Christ's mom, and they're both in the womb. And being related, the moms get together, they have a little conversation and scripture records that uh, uh, John leapt in the womb just being that close to Jesus the light. Before Jesus had even been born to an earthly mother, he's already causing a stir. And there's that interaction there that just pretty special, that intersection then would, would get more robust as Jesus uh, made his way into our world and the full scope of what he was about became clear. You skip down to verse 14. Here's the description of Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of Jesus the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Underline that, uh, put that in your memory bank. Verse 15, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now that's a little bit of weird wording. Uh, John uh, the Baptist uh, was uh, born about four months before Jesus was born. And yet here, uh, John the Baptist is making clear, hey, even though I was born first, Jesus was here first. Because Jesus is almighty God. Jesus is our creator. He's always been, but he's showing up in the flesh right now. And because he's always been and he's God Almighty, that means he surpasses me. And then it goes on in verse 16, talking about Jesus, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. That's good, underline that. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, 
Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Again, underline grace and truth. Grace and truth are two words that I, I believe wholeheartedly describe Jesus the most simply and the most powerfully. You want to know the full scope of Jesus? Then come, uh, let the full scope of grace be dumped all over you. And let the full scope of what truth is all about be dumped all over you. And you're beginning to sense the full scope of Jesus. Now, there's something about grace and truth through the person of Jesus that has just saturated uh, John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist was saturated with the grace and truth, the truth of Jesus, then the, the overflow of that was his service to Jesus. He received grace. He received truth. And so then it was just natural that grace would overflow out of him, that truth would overflow out of him. In other words, his service, John the Baptist's service, was a direct result of receiving the grace and truth of Jesus. Catch me on this. I believe that John the Baptist was a good giver, a good server, primarily because he was a good receiver. He had first received grace. He'd first received truth. So then it was natural. It was possible for him just to give that away. Our service shouldn't start from a place of just feeling like we've got some obligation or we have work to do. If that's the motivation for our service, then we're going to wind up wiped out and ineffective, exhausted, frustrated. But if our service comes from a place of uh, being rooted in the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, that's a whole different ballgame. There's a whole bunch of wrong motivations for serving. Have you, ever, have you ever looked back on a season where you served in the church or you served in an organization or a community or whatever? And you looked back and you went, oh man, that probably was not from the right motives. I was probably doing that for a whole different set of motives. Here, here's a handful of wrong motives. One, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, one wrong motive for, for serving would be uh, that you're trying to be good enough for him. If you feel like you got to serve so that God will think you're good enough, you don't understand the gospel. None of us are good enough and we'll never be good enough. And guess what? God loves you anyway. He's got a plan and a purpose for you anyway. There's no amount of your uh, serving that is going to make you uh, more good in his eyes than you are right now. The only thing that's a game changer on that is what Jesus has already done for you in going to the cross for you. Another wrong motive is, is to get something from God. You ever do that? You ever serve? If you've got kids, you know those times where if you're a parent and your kid comes in and says, oh, mom, 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 let, let, me, let me make dinner for you tonight. Oh, dad, 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 let me wash your car. Oh, oh mom, mama, I, I made your bed. Oh, dad, I did the laundry. What's the first thing that's coming out of your mouth as a parent is, what do you want from me? <laughs> I know you. You don't do this in and of yourself. You're serving me because you want to get something from me. I know you. And God can see right through that. And that's not a good motivation for our service to him. Uh, a lot of us can serve him for, to try to pay him back for rescuing us. Theologically, that you're on a slippery slope then. That's the thinking, okay, Jesus did his part. Now I better do my part. Man, good luck with that then. I mean, how much service do you have to do to balance out the scales on the son of God laying his life down for you. Come on. Another wrong motivation would be to impress others. 
You start serving so that, oh, look at them. Look at what they're doing. Or you start serving to, uh, to belong. Now, when you start to serve and you find a community that you're, you're giving your life away, will you find a place of belonging? Yeah. But that should, should that be the primary motivation for why you serve? No. Another wrong motivation might be uh, because you think he needs you. Okay, headline, newsflash. God doesn't need you. Okay? Does that mean he doesn't love you? Does, he, does that mean he doesn't have some purpose for you? No. But does he need you? Is, is the earth revolving around you? Is it all going to collapse if you don't do what you're going to? No. <sighs> okay, to everybody, let's collective take a deep breath. Uh, this is a good thing, not a bad thing. God doesn't need you. <sighs> Yay. Does he want you? Does he love you anyway? Yeah. Another deep breath. <laughs> That's good. Or sometimes we can serve in a way which assumes that you don't need him. Uh, that could be equally as destructive or problematic. Um, when we step into service, we desperately need God. And the moment I start to drift away and serve, like, oh, I can operate independent from you, God. I, I don't need what, okay, we got some issues. And I just feel like John the Baptist seemed to understand the right heart and the right motivation as he went about serving. He was not perfect, uh, but there's something helpful and instructive about him that is a blessing to me. I hope it will be for you. Flip it over to John chapter three as we uh, lean into familiar passage. John opened the door to, we're gonna just kind of press into it a little bit here. John chapter three, verse 26. John's got his own disciples as he's been doing the work of the ministry, calling people to sin, uh, repentance from sin and to baptism, speaking the truth, trying to guide and direct and help people ultimately toward Jesus. Uh, John's got his own followers. And now he's gonna take the opportunity, like they, there's an argument that's come up with the disciples and some other guy. John's disciples come, verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, Jesus, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, verse 27, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Did you know that whatever you uh, get in ministry is because God has directed that from heaven. Whatever you are involved in ministry wise, whatever is allowed, the scope of what you're able to experience, that's God orchestrating and directing. Um, Sometimes you're in seasons where it's just robust and you've got more ministry opportunities, more service opportunities than you can possibly imagine. And then there's other times where it seems very lean. You're like, gosh, God, do I have anything here? Or I've only got two people and they got 200. And John's just reminding them, hey, all of this is God's involved. He's orchestrating. And there's nothing more inherently special just about big crowds. Just because the ministry that these people have or that person has is two hundreds doesn't make them any more valuable to this person over here whose ministry is to one. Ministry's ministry and it's all directed from heaven. But really what's at the heart of John's disciples is some competition. I mean, they're looking across the Jordan and they've had a very successful baptism business. Thank you very much. I mean, they had a good system. They had a charismatic personality. Obviously, I'm making light of some of this. But they look and here's all these amazing uh, life change and all these people coming to John for baptism. And now, hey, 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 John, look at their, they're going over to that guy. I know he's a big deal, but come on. 
Maybe we need to, we need to fix our marketing plan, Jesus. Maybe we come up with a better system. Well, let's figure this out because this isn't good. They're all going over across the river. We need to be, can we figure out to warm the water up or something, John? We can go into places with not as, you know, many rapids or, can we give them a candy at the end of the baptism or something? What can we do? And John, just to be clear, is just saying, guys, this isn't a competition. Goodness gracious, if ministry, if service in the kingdom of almighty God ever becomes a competition, get out. That's why I'm proud to stand up here and just say on behalf of all the pastors here at Heights, we're not in competition with other churches in our community. I just spoke at another one in town a couple of weeks ago. We, we pray for each other. The pastors of the other churches talk and pray and we traded texts even this morning about, oh, we're praying for amazing things to happen at your church today. Oh, you too, we're excited for what God's... Guys, if the leadership is that way, can't the bodies in those respective places be that way? If they believe by God's word is the source of truth and Jesus is the only way to salvation, then we're on the same team. We're not gonna do a competition thing. If we have a season here where uh, there's a lot going on and it looks uh, big numerically, cool, and if it has a season where it's still God's work, but it's a sifting season where it's smaller, then that's from him too. And a church that's tiny is just as valuable as a church that's huge. But then he leans in here, verse 28. John says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. Pastor John referenced that last week. That's a good declaration, by the way. But he says, but I am sent ahead of him. Okay, this isn't rocket science, but hang with me. John had an important role to play, didn't he? In that particular moment in history, John the Baptist had an important role to play. But did that mean that he was the Messiah? No. He was pointing to the Messiah, but he was not the Messiah. You guys, you have an important role to play. I don't want to minimize that. Every single one of you as a follower of Jesus here, you have an important role to play. But does that mean that the weight of the world is on your shoulders the way that it was on the Messiah, Jesus Christ's shoulders? No. You have an important role to play just like John the Baptist did. And he uses all sorts of things in your life so that you can be used of him the way that he imagined and designed. John the Baptist was of the uh, priestly line of Aaron, which goes all the way back, early Old Testament, Moses and Aaron together. He's in that ge geological, genealogical line. Uh, John the Baptist was uh, born to a priest named Zechariah. John the Baptist was born to old parents. And the high likelihood is that they probably were not around too much longer after he was born. You think that had some effect on his story and his journey? I think so. John the Baptist obviously had some gifting as a prophet, gifting as a teacher. John the Baptist, by way of personality or wiring by God, was an incredibly rugged man. And God used all of that, his lineage, his background, his parents, his personality, some gifting that he had to be used to fulfill an important role. He was a rugged guy. He wore camel hair and ate lo locusts and honey and he was a tough guy. Are there any rugged men or rugged women in Prescott in this church? Yes. I'm, like half of you in here are way more rugged than I'll ever be. And your ruggedness can be something that God used. That's not for no reason. 
just as my sissiness is not for no reason. My sensitivity or whatever you call it, God, God's using all of that. John had an important role to play. You have an important role to play. Listen to me. I believe wholeheartedly that God has put you here on this earth to do something that no one else can do. So what is it? He has given you loves and spiritual gifts and personality and personal experiences and struggles and strengths. A certain heart for things that other people don't have, that's not for no reason. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. You have an important role to play in his kingdom. Amen. Now, I think John knew that he had an important role to play but I think he also knew that his most important role wasn't necessarily in his ministry role. Hang with me. This is where he goes next. Look at verse 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. John says, okay, the bride belongs to the groom. The friend who attends the groom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the groom and listens for him and hears his voice. That, that joy is mine, and it's now complete. John goes into marriage language. John goes into a conversation uh, about uh, um, a different sort of role. And he starts to describe a marriage language. And their marriages then were a little different than our marriages now, the ceremony. But this friend uh, who attends to the bridegroom, that's what we would call a best man. And, you know, here comes the man and the woman together. We're so excited about that. And here's this wedding celebration that is two becoming one and this amazing experience. But the ceremony that's been leading to this moment is a glorious one. Now, the best man had the responsibility uh, to, to put the logistics or the detail of the wedding ceremony all together. And there was no greater joy for the friend of the groom, the best man, than for the ceremony to begin and for everything to go smoothly. For that intimate relationship to come together and to be the friend that orchestrated that sort of event was a very special moment that should bring joy. At the core of it, what, what, what I think that John is trying to remind us all of is, yes, you've got an important role to play. But the most important role that John the Baptist played was not his ministry. The most important role that John the Baptist pray, played was as a friend to Jesus Christ. As a child of God. As one who had first received a marriage relationship with the God of the universe. You have an important role to play in this church, in this community, in this world, but your most important role is as a friend of Almighty God. Your most important role is as a child of God. Your most important role is in this marriage relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you receive that, if you're anchored into that, if that's the place from which you operate as his kid, as his friend, do you think that's going to change your perspective on how you serve him? I do. Remember the story of the prodigal son? There's a dad who had two sons. And the younger son doesn't want a relationship with the dad. He just wants the dad's stuff. 
The dad is gracious just to hand over the inheritance to the son. The younger son takes off and wastes it all, hits rock bottom. And when he hits rock bottom, he realizes the precious relationship that he once had with his daddy. And he begins to make his way back to his daddy only to discover the daddy's in a full on sprint for him and wraps this kid up in his arms and welcomes him back in. Now, can you imagine the ease with which the younger son now served his dad once he'd got back home? Can you imagine the joy that was filled in that young son's heart when his daddy wrapped him up in that huge embrace and he got to be a part of that family, a part of that household? Do you think that serving even felt like serving anymore? No, it was just an outpouring of I'm his kid and we're in this family relationship. And so now what a beautiful opportunity I've got. You compare that to the older son who'd stayed back. The older son who kept using slave language when he talked about his relationship with his dad. All these years, dad, I've been slaving for you and you've never done anything for me. And here I am still slaving for you to this day. I guess I'll be slaving for you forever. And the dad says something that I think God would say to every single one of us. Guys, if you feel like you're God's slave or God's servant even before you come to understand that you're God's kid and you're God's friend, He turns to that older son and he says, son, everything that I have is yours. And that's always been the case. All the grace, all the truth, all the comfort, all the safety, all the provi- I've got for you. You don't have to be my slave. I don't want you to be my slave. I want you to be my, my son. For those of you that are already serving and just fe- feeling weary in your service to God, just with a big smile on his face, hear him saying to you, okay, servant is cool, but you're my son. You're my daughter. Now, is there some cool stuff to go do now as a son or daughter? You bet. For those of you that maybe have not stepped into service because you're going, I I don't want to be a slave to someone or, okay. He gets that too. He's just saying, yeah, I don't want you to be my slave either. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to be my friend. And out of that changes a whole lot of perspective about our service. Verse 30, John wraps it up. And he says these famous words, he must become greater, referring to Jesus. I must become less. Other translations say he must increase, I must decrease. Which just as a way of life is a pretty good way to go. Easy, no. But that sums up so much of our journey. Uh, There's a humility that says "I I must decrease, I must become less and he must increase. John the Baptist quite literally was saying, hey, um, I I am, uh, I'm in a spot here where I've had an important role to play. My most important role was as his friend, um, but what's going on right here, right now, quite literally, John's saying, my ministry must decrease. My ministry must become less so that his might increase, so that his might become greater. And if you boiled everything down, the core of the ministry of John the Baptist was pave the way to Jesus, quite literally. Now it's so crazy to me all these years later, if you boil down all the stuff about me and you, as servants of God, yes. As sons and daughters and friends of God, yes. If you boil it all down, our respective roles, regardless of what they are, hey, It's to pave the way to Jesus. 
I, I just want to point you to Jesus. I want to make it easier for you to get a sense of who Jesus is. If you're in a conversation with Jesus or you are working with Jesus or uh, you are experiencing Jesus, if you had a tangible moment of interaction with Jesus, that it would feel and sound a whole lot like what's going on between me and you right now. And so whether you work with kids or you work with senior citizens or you work inside the church or outside the church or local or global or uh, you're doing something inside your family that's an act of service or uh, it's uh, um, something up front or behind the scenes, you're holding doors, you're cooking for people or you're teaching or you're leading worship, all of it, all those roles are just paving the way to Jesus. Can I point you to him? Can I give you a little better picture of what he would be like? And that, that's all of us. Knowing that at some point we must decrease and he must increase. Knowing at some point we should become less and he should become more. Knowing at some point, hey, regardless of my ministry to you, I don't want you to pave the way. I'm not paving the way to me. I'm paving the way to Jesus. At some point, we got to humble ourselves and say, well, this wasn't about me in the first place. The only reason I'm doing what I'm doing is to help you get closer to him. And man, we need that. We need that so much. Right here in our own church, Heights is no different than uh, the overwhelming majority of churches across America. 10 to 20% of people that call this church home are doing all the serving. That's common unfortunately, which means 80 to 90% are not. And so we struggle constantly with, with what ministry can go on right here in the body. We're certainly going to struggle when we need at least 300 more serve team members as we head out into this next season. But it doesn't come as we crack the whip or whatever. It just comes going, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a friend of God's. I'm a son or daughter of God's. And the more that saturates, then out of the overflow of that is plug me in. Let me go. Where can I serve? Whatever you need. And so on that end, if you, you have a opportunity, if you're not serving somewhere, thank you from the depths of our heart if you are. And if you aren't, um, we'd love to help you discover where your place might be, knowing you have an important role to play. And uh, there's people out in the lobby today uh, that have computers there that can help you uh, sign up or get information from ministries. Or right now, you can, it won't bug me, you can pull out your phone and text uh, serve to the number that you see there on your screen. You text the word serve to 928-218-2939 and what's gonna happen is uh, it'll generate this little response to you with the link, you click on it, fill out some information and one of our ministries will contact you and give you just the scope of what these ministry needs are or what it looks like and uh, kind of go from there. Last week was uh, the men's retreat last weekend. And um, it was such a life-giving weekend. We headed up to Lost Canyon in Williams. And uh, that experience there as a couple hundred guys came together was such a life-giving time where, where Jesus was just changing all of our hearts. We had main sessions. We had time to have fun. We had time to hang out. You name it. And... Um, it was great. We had these breakout sessions where people were teaching on different things. We had times of worship. And I watched guys step up, not on staff who led worship, watch guys step up and do tech stuff, watch guys just be there for each other, watch guys with administrative gift gifting help check guys in. I watched guys with a spiritual gift of teaching uh, teach different breakout sessions. I mean, just all across the board, it was just a microcosm of what's going on in the church it was such a beautiful thing. And then I was humbled by this one individual that kind of reluctantly said yes to uh, do one of the breakout sessions. And he wasn't a teacher, wasn't an expert in some area, but he had a testimony. He had a story and quite the story at that of where he had been without Jesus and what Jesus has been doing in his life. And that, to demystify a lot of our service, 
that might be the service God. He's just going to take your story, your journey, how he's wired you and just give you an outlet to say, this is how I've seen Jesus change me. I'd love to come alongside you. We need that all across their board. And by God's grace, we'll get there. And so, Father, we just thank you for this amazing church. We're so blessed by these brothers and sisters in here, blessed by the tons of people that are here and uh, don't have a relationship with you. Thank you that you love them and you're pursuing them. Help them, Father, discover their purpose. Father, we just uh, take a moment here to um, allow you to settle in on our hearts. Before we leave, just to um, take a brief moment to lift our voices to you with thanksgiving. We are reminded, God, that yes, you are who you say we are. We, we are who you say we are. God, we are uh, so thankful for what you're going to do. Fuel us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen.